Asking the right questions is one of the fastest ways to grow your confidence as a new ER nurse. In this video, I'll show you how to quickly assess patients with shortness of breath, spot red flags, and guide your care even in high pressure situations. You've got this, I'm here to help, so thank you for watching. Here's what you're gonna walk away with by the end of the video. You'll learn the key questions to ask when a patient presents with shortness of breath and how those questions help you spot life-threatening red flags early. I'll also walk you through how to use the sample mnemonic so you never feel stuck during your assessment, even when things are moving fast. You'll learn how to adjust your questions depending on whether you suspect asthma, CHF, a pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, cardiac ischemia, and what to do if your patient is too short of breath to even speak and answer these questions. Most importantly, you're going to gain the tools to help you stay focused, think critically, and confidently guide care in the ER. And after the video, if you want everything in one place to help you grow faster, feel more prepared, and become a confident ER nurse, you can check out our resources. Links are below. So, as an ER nurse, time is everything. You need to be efficient, whether you're getting report from EMS, triaging a patient, or taking over for care. Asking the right questions helps you pick up on red flags early, before a patient crashes or even deter deteriorates. You're not just collecting information, you're evaluating the urgency and guiding the next steps. These questions help you and the team prioritize care, especially when combined with patients' vital signs and risk factors. This is what separates a task-oriented nurse from a critical thinking one. The sample mnemonic is one of the most important tools for any ER nurse especially when things get chaotic. It gives you a simple structure to fall back on so you don't miss something essential during triage, during handoff, or even on just on your initial assessment. Let's break it down. S is for signs and symptoms. What's the patient feeling? What brought them in? What are they complaining of? What's their chief complaint? A is for allergies. Always ask about allergies to medications, to food, or even latex. You don't want to miss this before administering a medication that the patient is allergic to. M is for medications. What are they currently taking? Include prescribed medications, over-the-counter medications, and even supplements that they're on. P is for past medical history. Do they have a history of heart failure, COPD, clot, asthma, anything that could be related to their shortness of breath? L is for last oral intake. When did they last eat or drink anything? This is especially important if they might need sedation or procedures. And finally is E. E is for events leading up to this episode. What were they doing when it started? Were they at rest, climbing stairs, any triggers or timeline details that could help you connect the dots? Sample is going to be your anchor. It's going to keep you focused even when things are moving fast in the ER. Now, let's get into the specific questions you should be asking when a patient presents with shortness of breath. Start with, how long has it been going on? And was the onset sudden or was it gradual? A sudden onset is a red flag. Think of pulmonary embolism, a pneumothorax, or even an MI. Gradual onset may point to infection like pneumonia or fluid overload like CHF. Next, ask, is it constant or does it come and go? If it's intermittent, consider arrhythmias like SVT, atrial fibrillation, or even VTAP. Then go into what affects it. What makes it better or what makes it worse? If lying flat makes it worse, think pulmonary edema or CHF. If exertion makes it worse, think cardiac ischemia, cardiac valve problems, structural issues with the heart, or even anemia. Ask about recent exposure to allergens or smoke if you are suspecting something like asthma. Also ask about a cough. Do they have a cough? Is it productive? If so, what's the color? Green or yellow points to infection. Pink and frothy, think pulmonary edema. It's bright red, bloody. TB needs to be on your radar if that's the case. Ask if they have any associated symptoms. For example, do they have chest pain? Get that ECG, but don't forget also a PE or pneumothorax because with chest pain, the first thing that could should pop into your mind is a STEMI and MI, right? So that's how we get the ECG. But again, don't forget that chest pain can also be caused by a pulmonary embolism and like we said, a pneumothorax. If they're also complaining of dizziness, could it be a cardiac issue, especially ischemia, or even an arrhythmia like SVT or just runs of VTAC like we discussed? Do they also have fever or chills? If they do, think infection and ask about sick contacts. If their whole family at home is sick, and they're having fevers and chills with the shortness of breath, you're thinking things like pneumonia or something infectious. And don't forget to ask, do you have leg swelling or have you been immobile for a long time? 
If so, you need to be thinking about DVTs and pulmonary embolisms. You also always need to ask, have you had this before and what was done for you? This can tell you if it's a known condition like a CHF or COPD and how they usually respond and what treatments were done for them that actually worked. Finally, ask about their medical history and medications. Do they have heart issues, lung disease? Do they take leg sticks? Do they miss a dose? That might explain why they're feeling short of breath. Past cabbage, asthma, COPD, CHF, all of these, if they have them, are going to be red flags that you want to know early so that you can prioritize this patient faster. These questions don't just give you data. They're going to guide the entire team towards faster, safer choices and care treatments for this patient. Now, once you've asked the general questions of shortness of breath, it's time to dig a little deeper based on what you suspect. Let's go over some of the condition-specific questions that can help confirm or rule out some of the common life-threatening causes, especially if you're out in triage and these patients are presenting with shortness of breath. You need to keep some of these conditions at the back of your mind so that you can ask more targeted questions and prioritize them so that the doctor sees them and gets the workup going faster, right? So starting with pulmonary embolism, you want to ask, was the shortness of breath sudden? Have they been immobile recently, like during a long flight or car ride? Do they have any leg swelling or leg pain? And, and most importantly, do they have a history of blood clots? If you're thinking as asthma exacerbation, for example, you heard the lung sounds and there's wheezing, was there a known trigger like pollen, smoke, or exercise? How many times have they been using their inhaler today? Have they ever been intubated before? Because if they have, it lets you know that their asthma can get very bad very quickly. If you're concerned about congestive heart failure, ask, can they lie flat at night or do they need extra pillows to sleep? Have they noticed any recent weight gain or is there any swelling in their legs or worsening fatigue lately? And if it's a cardiac issue or ischemia that you're possibly thinking about, are they experiencing any chest pain? And some pressures, some patients, sorry, don't consider chest pressure as chest pain. So I always ask, hey, do you have chest pain and do you have any chest pressure as well? Do they feel their heart racing or any beats that are skipped like palpitations? Are they nauseous, dizzy or feeling lightheaded as well? These targeted questions help you guide your assessment, alert the provider early, and ultimately make you more faster, more reliable, and you can be better at identifying and gathering information more efficiently. But what if the patient is too short of breath to even talk? This is going to be common, and it's going to be a common critical situation in the ER that you're going to encounter often. Start by getting information from EMS, from family, or even the chart if possible. Even just knowing a few conditions like CHF, COPD, or renal failure can completely change how the patient is managed. If the patient is awake but can't speak, try asking yes or no questions. They cannot, do you have CHF? Do you have COPD? Have you missed dialysis? But sometimes there's not going to be any information at all. And that's when your assessment and your clinical judgment steps in. Listen to their lung sounds, watch their work of breathing, are they using accessory muscles or they're retracting, what's their oxygen status. And this is where the workup comes in, right, with the assessment. For example, with your lung sounds, if you heard crackles at the bases, you're thinking pulmonary edema, maybe pneumonia. If you heard wheezing, you're thinking more asthma or COPD. And then this is where, again, the workup comes in. The workup is going to give you a lot of information about what's going on with the patient. The provider for a patient like this, especially one that's working to breathe, is going to order a chest x-ray, an ABG or a VBG, and an ECG to rule out any cardiac issues. They'll get a CBC that lets us know the hemoglobin, the white count. They'll get a chemistry. They'll get a BNP. They'll get a D-dimer. And if more information is needed, they may even get a CT if, if a pulmonary embolism is suspected. Remember. When the patient is in respiratory distress and they're super hypoxic and they just can't talk, you need to prioritize stabilizing them first and then asking questions later. You're going to start with the non-rebreather mask to give them the highest oxygen possible, 100% FiO2. It's easy to apply, it's easy to place, and it delivers 100% FiO2. As the picture becomes clearer, as more information is um, gathered and the patient stabilizes it a, a little bit, you can go from a non rebreather to maybe a nasal cannula trying it out, or you can go from non, non rebreather to high flow or BiPAP, or if the patient just getting worse and worse and worse, the provider may choose to proceed with RSI and intubation. The key is to stay calm, act fast, and keep gathering clues as you go. You may not get the full story right away, but your actions can save their lives. So remember, you're all going to be a team. 
while you're getting your patient on the monitor, getting them on oxygen, the provider may be the one asking the questions. And it can be vice versa, right? You're gonna be you're gonna be working as a team, but you do need to know the important questions that need to be asked. But remember, you stabilize first and ask questions later. Now, let's move on to the question of the day. Why do we avoid intubation in DKA patients? Again, why do we avoid intubation in DKA patients? The answer to this is going to be at the bottom of the description text. And just remember, learn from everyone. See how they ask, see what kind of questions they ask, what type of concise assessments they ask. And don't pressure yourselves. It can take up to a year or two years to build any remote confidence in the ER. You just have to give yourself the time and you need to focus on reviewing the essentials, the ABCs, ACLS, pathology, and the important treatments for when patients come in really sick. I remember how hard it was trying to keep up, worrying about making mistakes, and constantly feeling behind. That's exactly why I created these resources to help you gain confidence and take control faster. Our ER Nurse Essentials book is your no-fluff guide to essential ER knowledge, such as triage, ABCs, advanced life support, and the most critical conditions, all in a clear, easy-to-understand format. Our PDF bundle includes the Essentials book, plus our charting guide to help you document quickly, safely, and with confidence. You'll also get our scenario book, packed with realistic, high-pressure cases to sharpen your critical thinking and prepare you for the unexpected. Use discount code ERREADY15 to save on the bundle. The course goes even further. It comes with book downloads, video lessons, practice tests, and if you need specific advice, you can always reach out to me. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.